webinar, so you have a control panel. In that panel, the first option is an orange box with an arrow that lets you collapse and expand your panel so that you can see the entire PowerPoint in front of you. Um, the second option is to raise your hand to request to be unmuted. Now, we do mute everyone automatically in a webinar of this size, um, but you can request to be unmuted. You can request to be unmuted by raising your hand by using that button there. Um, at that point, you can speak up for a question. You can also at any time put a question into the question box we'll answer or use the chat function at the bottom. Um, now, we've actually started things off by using the chat function today. There is a link in that box that you can use to go to our website and download the brief intervention observation sheet. That's something that we'll be talking through today. Um, next up, we do like to start by getting to know our audience. So we have some general questions we ask at the beginning of a webinar. Um, we use a poll function for that. So I am going to ask you to answer four questions that will follow in just a moment. Okay. You should see the question pop up as a blue box. Uh, the first is, what is your current professional role? I'll give you just a moment to respond. Great. And I'll move on to the next. Just a moment. OK, the next question it is, what field do you represent? Great, thank you for those responses. Next we have, do you conduct expert interventions? And the final is, do you see your agency using SBIRT? Great. Thank you so much for those responses. They are appreciated. Okay. I'm going to take a minute. Our presenter today, Dina Vandersloot. She is an expert in motivational interviewing consultant, trainer, and coach who has worked with a number of state, county, treatment, and primary care organizations uh, to promote the adoption and implementation of motivational interviewing and expert. So I'm going to turn things over to her at this time. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to um, be with you all today. I'm actually um, coming to you from uh, sunny Southern California. So I wish I could actually stream some of the sunshine here. Um, hopefully, you're getting a little sun wherever you are. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking today about the brief negotiated interview and what we're going to actually cover today. If I can get my screen to uh, start working here, give me just a minute. Of course it wants to. Okay. Oh, I want to start with actually some acknowledgments. We are, I'm really going to be presenting a model um, and I'll tell you more about the actual program um, through UMKC and uh, so I want to acknowledge the uh, project leaders there, as well as um, uh, much of this slide development was um, completed by my coworker, a previous coworker, David Jefferson. What we're going to cover today is to present the UMKC as per training model. I'll tell you more about that in a minute, um, and how to use the brief intervention observation fidelity scale. 
And we're going to really uh, deconstruct the brief negotiated interview into its basic components and talk about you know, wording that will enhance the interview and some specific steps to improve the quality. So really, how do you help somebody and coach them um, to increase the effectiveness of the BNI that they might be delivering? And finally, um, we have Sarah Knopf Amalung um, on the line as one of the presenters today. And um, after we go through the process of doing a rating of the brief negotiated interview, um, Sarah and I are going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned from their project. So it's great to have her on board. So to get started, let me tell you a little bit about the project. Um, this is actually a SAMHSA-funded grant. Um, and it started in September 2013, so it's uh, about a year and a half into the grant. It's one of 14 grantees, and basically these are expert grants that were funded to really um, integrate expert into uh, colleges and universities. Uh, they were previously funded as some of the medical residency programs. And actually one of the first medical residency programs that I worked on was actually the Oregon expert medical residency grant. So um, a little bit about this project. Uh, the goals for this project were really to develop a sustainable expert training program. And so integrating expert for uh, nursing students, nurse practitioners, and master of social work. Um, as you can see here, the goal of the number of students to actually train and also to create a, a program that was sustainable after the grant and continue expert training as a standard part of those uh, curriculum. Um, this shows you a little bit about the expert curriculum. Um, basically, didactic training. Um, you can see here on the slide the different areas that are actually covered. Um, and um, I, and Sarah's on the line too, so um, she might um, join in here. But usually anywhere from four to six hours of the didactic training um, students receive. And after they receive the didactic training around the expert, then they have opportunities to do at least two role plays um, with classmates. Um, these are using uh, various case studies. And then following the role plays, they have the opportunity to deliver a brief intervention with standardized patients. And so they get two opportunities to do that. And they receive feedback using the brief intervention observation sheet, which we're going to be covering today. So that's what the curriculum looks like. And you know, one of the pieces of this, I have worked on several different projects. I've worked with Oregon, and I've worked with the state of Washington. And you know, one of the things that we are always looking at, like, OK, so to what degree of fidelity are people implementing expert or the brief intervention? And you know, one thing that has always stuck with me, uh, Dean Fixen, who does a lot of implementation research, always says that, I just love this quote, you know, people can't benefit from an intervention that they don't receive. So part of this whole process in looking at outcomes, are people actually giving or getting a brief intervention that is delivered with some fidelity? So that's really the focus of our webinar today um, and what with this project has had a particular emphasis on. Um, the fidelity rating, and you, this is what you have actually in the pop-up chat or box that uh, Danielle referred to earlier, is the brief intervention observation form. It is um, basically the form that is being used in this project uh, to rate students who are delivering a brief intervention with a standardized patient. It has uh, 10 different items, and basically, it is split into yes or no, so it's not on the continuum, but basically they did this item or did not do this item. There is one item that is actually more on a scale from not at all to very effectively when we're looking at the overall motivational style that is being used by students. So basically what we're going to do here in just a minute is walk you through how this would, what this would look like if somebody is using this particular fidelity tool uh, to rate a audio taped um, brief intervention session. This is the form here that you do have a copy of. Um, the form was actually adapted from the brief intervention adherence and competence scale. Um, and also, 
when I was working with the Oregon Medical Residency Program, um, the uh, residents who were taught the brief intervention would have this integrated into their um, what they refer to as OSCEs, but basically their standardized patient interviews at the uh, at one point during their year. So that's the that's the uh, the fidelity instrument, and you might want to pull it up as we walk through the interview. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the brief negotiated interview. It is a, a four-step process. Um, it was developed actually by uh, Drs. Gail Nanofrio and Bernstein's, along with um, Stephen Rolnick, uh, one of the main developers of motivational interviewing. So it parallels motivational interviewing, but it but it is an adaptation. So if you if you want to pull up. Uh, the rating form, if you happen to have it. If not, we'll go through the pieces as we go through this. And what I'm going to do is just really talk you through the four steps of the brief negotiated interview. And we'll be listening to an audio recording um, that Jan Rolstead of the uh, Mid-America ATTC uh, granted us permission to use. And basically, she She's actually um, part of this project has the faculty, um, when they learn this information, they also go through the process of practicing delivering uh, brief interventions and being audio taped and receiving feedback. So one thing, um, you know, that, and the other piece of this, I think as you listen to this, this is really how um, in teaching this model, we've done it. We found, I've been teaching this model for, I don't know, probably about the last five years. And it's a, it's a, on one hand, it's, you know, a pretty straightforward process to go through, but there are lots of small steps along the way. And so we, I've really found that if we can break it down into the four steps and the various components, it seems to help people learn the process. Um, so the first thing that we encourage people to do is, okay, if you're going to go into a brief negotiated interview, you need to know what the person's audit or DAS scores are. Um, the audit being the alcohol screening form and the DAS being the drug screening form, and or whatever screening instrument you're actually using. You know, identifying what sco what zone they score in. You know, just a little caveat that I'll put in here. I recently was doing a project where it was doing screening and brief interventions for pregnant women, and we were using the five P screening tool. Now, the one thing is, if you're using a brief negotiated interview, you have to adapt it some because um, especially as you'll see here, this is really um, predicated on somebody using the audit and the DAST. And so it, it, it still follows that four-step process, but um, you have to make some adaptations. Um, so what zone do they score in? What is your recommendation for the person? Um, and making sure that you have the zone education information ready at the beginning. So first, let's talk about the step number one, which is raising the subject. And basically, what I'm going to do is walk you through what are the components that are on the brief intervention um, observation sheet. We'll listen to that segment of an interview, actual interview with a standardized patient. And then, and as you're, as you're listening to just say, okay, did I hear this person actually um, deliver these components? So some tips first about the first step, raising the subject, um, to be really prepared to explain what the alcohol or drug zone indicates. And, and I find this is a really a key piece um, because if you're going to tell somebody that they are in the risky zone, what does the risky zone mean? Or if you're going to tell someone that they scored in the harmful zone, what does that actually mean? Um, an important piece of really the feedback. Um, the other piece is this is to tell the client about what you're going to do. I, um, I I work with UMKC, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that I, I'm doing is doing a lot of the coding. And so I listen to the same standardized patient, you know, receiving several different brief interventions. And it's really interesting, you know, this first step might seem very basic and, okay, there's not a lot to it, but you really get a sense of how the patient responds differently depending on how well the person sets the stage for the interview. And if they take a little bit of time to orient the patient 
to what is happening, you know, what their role is in the clinic. Um, and in this particular uh, scenario that you're going to be listening to, uh, the person delivering it would be more in the role of being, sometimes it's the nurse, um, and sometimes this might be more the role of somebody who is a behavioral health specialist. Um, also remembering to use open-ended questions and reflections and summaries. And, you know, one of the tips that we give people is this is really an opportunity to engage the patient or client and find out, you know, what, how do they see their alcohol or drug use. And so really to be interested and curious. The key pieces on the brief observation sheet um, that we're actually rating are, you know, does the person explore their, explain their role and respectfully ask permission to have the discussion about their alcohol and drug use? And um, do they review the patient's alcohol and drug use pattern? So this is step one. Um, here, I just included here some you know, possible scripting for people about what they, what they might say. A big piece of this is also normalizing the process for patients or clients to let them know, you know, we provide this for all our patients, this is why we do it, um, asking permission to talk for a few minutes about their drug and alcohol use. Whoops. I'm Okay, I had a little bit ahead of time. So what, basically those are the two pieces that we're looking for. And I'm going to turn it back to Danielle as we listen to this part of the interview. All right, we're going to start that now. And you are Michael. Michael, nice to meet you. Um, I'm actually part of a new healthcare team at the clinic here, um, part of the screening form, uh, it, the screening form you completed and my role as a health coach are part of a new emphasis the clinic has on more whole health care for all of our patients. So whether a patient comes in for a doctor's visit like you did or a routine annual uh, physical, uh, we ask them to do this annual screening that we'll talk about today if you like. And uh, so I'm here kind of to, to address this side of your, your life. Um, Michael, um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you to tell me what uh, your alcohol looks like in a typical week. Great. Oops. Okay, so basically, um, you know, as you heard there, she explained a little bit about her role as well as um, to ask um, him to tell her about his alcohol use. Um, so, you know, those would both be checked off as yes on the form. Um, sorry, I had the two slides switched up wrong. Um, so a couple more things on this one is, you know, some different open-ended questions that seem to work well when people are doing this part of the brief negotiated interview. You know, what else can you tell me about your alcohol and drug use? Keeping in mind that on the alcohol form, um, the person would have already checked, you know, how often they're using, um, but to really have them say it in their own words. One of the, actually, um, we have talked about this, those of us who have done some coaching and listening to the different recordings, is this is a question that seems to work particularly well about just saying, tell me about your alcohol or drug use and what it looks like in a typical week. Sometimes if you just say, what can you tell, or tell me a little bit about your alcohol and drug use, people will be like, what do you want to know? So, you know, this, this tends to be a, a useful question. The other thing is that, at this point in time, um, and you're going to see in, in the actual rating form that this idea of looking at the pros and cons comes a little bit later in the interview. Um, however, if somebody is a little hesitant to talk about their use or maybe even seems a little defensive about it, this can also be a good point just to say, so tell me a little bit about what you like about your alcohol use. Um, you know, are there any not so good things about it? So that's basically step one. Um, and, you know, in coaching the person, um, you know, basically they, you know, covered that very well. She explained her role, normalized the process a bit. 
Um, and now stepping into step two to provide feedback. Um, just a word or two about providing feedback. This is a really a key component of the brief negotiated interview, um, especially for individuals that are drinking at levels that maybe they really haven't experienced very many negative consequences related to their use, but they really are in that risky zone. The feedback, I think, is really the key thing for helping to start developing some of that discrepancy between you know, where they are and they're drinking now and maybe where they want to be relative to their health. Um, so it is a key piece of the brief intervention and, you know, looking at frequency and norms, you know, how does their use compare to other people's use, um, both weekly and daily, what are some of the risk factors to actually help them look at some negative consequences that maybe they hadn't thought as being related to their alcohol or drug use but actually are, as well as to start giving them some ideas about, you know, what are actual alcohol dependency symptoms and what do they look like and are they beginning to experience any of those. So this is a huge step I think for information and it's that balance between not wanting to provide too much information but providing enough that it begins to really get the person starting to think about their use. So the key pieces of fidelity and when we're teaching this model as well is that during this step you want to share the patient's alcohol and drug so scores and their zone. You want to review the NIAAA guidelines relevant to the person's um, gender and uh, age group. And also explore with them uh, the connection to any health, social, or work issues that they may already currently be experiencing. You know, depending on the setting that you're in, um, if this is somebody, for example, um, who is pregnant, of course, you would talk about the connection if they are actually drinking or using and pregnancy, um, or if somebody is having, you know, is experiencing mental health issues exploring the connection between depression, anxiety, and uh, drinking above the low-risk drinking guidelines. Um, this is where it's really helpful if you have a tool. Um, you can go on several websites. I'm not sure if the UMKC has this up on their website, but I know Espert Oregon uh, has it on their website as well as Washington Espert. Um, you can download these and um, adapt them for your own use, but uh, it's really helpful to have this tool that you can actually show people. I Just a, a quick little story here, um, a mental health uh, agency is implementing ESPERT in Seattle, Washington, and they're really doing, uh, completing ESPERT on everybody who enters into their program, and this one young man, he actually was in chemical dependency treatment, but he still, they, she's, the, the brief, um, the behavioral health specialist delivered a brief intervention and when she showed him the pyramid and talked about the fact that he was in zone four or the dependent zone, he was, I mean, and this was somebody who was already in treatment and he was really surprised and he basically, what he said to her was, oh, I guess it's really serious. This is, I'm, this is really serious. But just having that visual for him was really impactful. So I think for some people who are visual people, the tools are really helpful, as you can see here. Um, a piece from the tool also is kind of a handy reminder about um, the feedback that you want to deliver to talk about the low risk uh, drinking guidelines um, to talk about the score and zone and also this idea of where they fall on the pyramid is really important um, and it can be also helpful to point out when we're talking about a drink um, what does an actual drink consist of. So let's listen to uh, Jan in this demonstration uh, provide feedback to the patient, Michael. Michael, um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you to tell me what uh, your alcohol looks like in a typical week on all use. Um, well, I, I usually go out to lunch with business partners and people that I consult. I like to have a drink at lunchtime usually, uh, scotch or wine, depending on. Um, I usually have a drink with dinner. Dinner, drink with 
two, one usually. Um, and then I might have five or six beers on Saturday and Sunday during the football games. Just want to relax. Okay. Well, thank you. How often are the business lunches? Uh, I mean, I usually go out four, four times a week. Okay. Close to it. So four times a week, two to three drinks at each of those settings, and then some weekend with friends, yeah. I assume. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go over now, form you fill it out. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. I want to show you how we score it. That's kind of interesting, I think. Uh, if you recall filling it out a few moments ago in our, in, in our waiting room, um, when you score closer to the right side on any of these questions, there's a higher value to those responses. So your score totaled seven, okay. and seven put you in zone three. It's clearly less drinks a day. It's clearly less drinks a day. And, and 
Yeah, and you can't you can't hold off and say, great, I'm gonna have fourteen drinks well, tonight. That's I said that sounded like I was sticking to the four drinks day pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I see here monthly you slip over to six or more. But uh, so you're right. How many drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day when you're drinking? Three or four would be within that daily limit with alcohol. But if you all do the multiplication here and you do have four times a drink, and, and I think in our conversation maybe I heard even a few more drinks if it's uh, truly three to four times at a business luncheon and then a weekend with friends, we could be we could be at the minimum of sixteen. Mm -hmm. So so a bit over. Um, does that concern you and with what I said about relating it to, to, to the stomach? Yeah, well, I mean, I never really considered it um, when I came here. I wasn't really thinking of along those lines because I just didn't know different stresses at home and work and whatnot. So it's just kind of, a, you know, I was just associating it really with that. But I didn't see how it could probably be affecting me for sure. Has the stomach pain interfered with work or life in general? Um, I mean, yeah, no. I mean, I try and get hit my deadlines anyway and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, it can definitely affect me when I'm at home, and, you know, around the kids and stuff like that. So usually I don't have a drink to kind of just relax me and whatnot. But. It's interesting to think that there's a possibility having a drink to relax you could be exacerbating this stomach pain and actually doing the opposite. Yeah. Um, I just want to summarize kind of what I've said here as a, as a health provider. I want you to know that. Um, According to your conversation about your weekly alcohol use and the way you filled out the screening, uh, you are at higher risk for the number of things I, I read earlier. And, and as, your, um, as one of your health care providers, I want to link it to possible cause of your stomach pain. Um, I'd like to know... This Great. Thanks, Danielle. So, in that... Uh, step two, um, you know, if you were actually rating this, did she share the patients? In this case, all he had was an alcohol score and zone, um, which she did. Um, she does, if you noticed in the um, recording, she says zone three at first and then makes the correction to two. So this goes back to, you know, being ready and thinking about, oh, what zone is it? She does a really nice job, I think, in this interview of actually explaining the scoring and um, going over the alcohol form. Um, she does let him know that he is in the risky zone um, and shared consequences related to the low risk zone. So she talks about some of the health, um, does a very thorough job of doing that, um, and then shared some consequences of the higher zones and possible progression of use. And so one of the things she did that I, I think is really helpful is that she did refer back to the alcohol pyramid and show him where he falls relative to the rest of the population. And I do find that that is one of, a piece of the step that sometimes um, gets missed. So check, uh, she definitely did those things. The other thing I guess just to point out is because this, and, and Sarah and I are going to talk about this as we um, discuss some of what we've learned from this project, um, is that it is a yes or no. So part of this process is yes, they do it, but if there are some coaching tips, um, that's really what we put in the comment section. So, okay, so yes, she did that. Did she review the NIAAA guidelines, the low-risk drinking guidelines? Um, yep, she talked about the low-risk limits for men. Um, she asked him, you know, what does being in the risky category and exceeding these limits make you think about? So actually providing some information and then finding out what the information actually meant to him. Um, he, his response was, that is really interesting. I would not consider myself risky. And, and about the same people as I go, I drink about the same as people I go to lunch with. Um, and so a coaching, just an example of a coaching um, might be that, ah, oh, this would be a great opportunity to provide a reflection to the person. For example, something like, you know, this is news to you and, and your drinking looks the same as your coworkers and clients, but just demonstrating that you hear the person and um, hear what they're saying to you. But, yep, check, uh, she did that piece. Um, and then the third piece being this exploring possible connections to health, um, social, or work issues. Um, 
you know, she said sometimes we don't see a connection. It can cause stomach pain. She asked, does that concern you? Um, and he basically says, didn't consider it before, but can see how it could be affecting me. Um, and, you know, a, a reflection here could have been, you know, this is new information. It's giving you something to think about. Um, the only thing like, I also might add as a coaching tip is I think it's helpful to actually ask the person if they're aware of the connection between whatever the health concern is and um, their alcohol use. And so one coaching tip might be, mm, you know, you might ask the person first if, you know, what, if they've noticed any connection between their alcohol use and um, stomach problems. But it was definitely addressed, so that would be check. Um, she has asked, has the stomach pain interfered with your life? And um, he said, it can affect me when I'm home, around the kids, I have a drink to relax. Another uh, opportunity for a reflection. Um, you know, so sometimes you come home with stomach pain and you have a drink and try to make it better. Um, she does give some feedback. The drinking may actually be having an opposite effect. Um, and then she provided a summary at the end of this step. But check. Um, she covered all uh, three key aspects of that step very well. Uh, just a few uh, feedback tips. Um, so some open-ended questions. I guess one thing, you know, one of the things that um, as you're doing this type of coding or listening to somebody and trying to coach them around it um, is this whole idea that in the feedback session, it, it's really helpful if you have a total number of drinks. And, now, one, she, she was very um, detailed in this interview about, you know, finding out how much and how much a drink was, which is good, but at the same time, you're also always balancing how much time. And in these standardized interviews, um, they're only given 10 to, around 10 to 15 minutes to do it. And so you also have to balance how much time do I want to spend on that. One of the things is when you first ask them about a week, um, I think it's helpful at that point in time to actually come up with a total. And if, I, if in listening to Michael um, and how often he was drinking and how much, my guess would be that he is drinking about, you know, anywhere from, you know, 18 to 22 drinks a week. And so in my, after he talked about his use, I might actually reflect that back because it helps them to compare it to the low-risk drinking guidelines. Um, you know, just saying, well, is there anything else that, you know, I, I, I should know about, you know, your alcohol use. Once again, this is also another opportunity if the person is really surprised, doesn't really see um, their alcohol as having any negative consequence. Uh, once again, the pros and cons can be useful. So that's, that gets us through the first two steps, and I wanted to just take a brief uh, break here for questions, if any of you have any questions or if any have come up in the chat box. Okay. Um, remember, you can use the option to raise your hand and I'll unmute you if you'd like to verbally state your question. Or you can always put it in the chat box or question box. We've been monitoring that through this process. I don't have any to read back to you at this time. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, feel free to, if they come up, to put them in the chat box and um, we'll take a couple other breaks for questions. Okay, so moving on to step three, enhancing motivation. Um, the fidelity uh, instrument for enhancing motivation is one of the steps is to ask the patient uh, to select a number on the readiness ruler um, and uh, to identify what that number is on the actual sheet. Um, and then the follow-up question being really the important piece to ask the patient why they didn't pick a lower number. Um, the other thing is that they don't have to do all of these, it's just to do one of them, keeping in mind that this step is really about finding out why it might be important for the person to make a change, if at all, uh, to their alcohol use. Um, and also uh, some other strategies could be to just ask them to look into the future and you know what would have to happen in your life for you to start thinking about wanting to make a change. And it can be cutting back. Um, my recommendation is more to say, you know, how ready are you to make any change? Or how important would it be to make any change to your drug or alcohol use at this time? To keep it open so that it remains patient-centered. Once again, uh, the tools come in handy. 
uh, for asking about the readiness ruler. It can be helpful for people to actually see the scale. Um, so let's listen to Jan do this part of the brief intervention. Okay, um, so basically um, she asked him the readiness ruler question along with the follow-up question. Um, she did a great job of explaining the ruler clearly. Um, the client selects a five and she asks why, you know, why a five and not a one or two, um, which is really designed to elicit some possible reasons for considering change. Um, so follow that step. Check. Um, now this is too where you have an opportunity um, to do some coaching, and, but it's also coaching, but I think it's also really important in the comments section to you know, also point out what the person is doing really well in the brief intervention. Um, so you might do you know, a reflection instead of a statement. Um, so actually giving back, this is I think one of the, I would say one of the things um, that this comes up often in coaching is that when you ask the follow-up question, the person will say what some of their possible reasons are. Um, and so you want to explore those a bit um, as well as, um, so you know, reflect it back to them about the pain and stomach problems and you know, not wanting to uh, make those worse, but also asking sometimes just what else. Um, so this is really the key step or, or purpose of this step is to su explore any possible reasons for change. She does um, do it though. Uh, you know, uh, just a step or two, like I said, when we're doing this, we're just looking for them to use at least one of the strategies. Um, oftentimes, I think a balance of learning how to do the brief intervention is that you want to use the strategies, but the strategies are there really to serve the conversation. Um, not that the conversations serve the strategies, so you want to use the strategies to really enhance the conversation and have it be a true dialogue. And so oftentimes I would more recommend not to try to do all of the strategies, but to do one and to do it really well. Um, this is just an example of, you know, if somebody says they're at a one or two on the readiness scale, uh, using that follow-up question probably of why are you a one or two and not a zero is probably not going to work that well. So another um, motivational strategy you can use is like, you know, how would it actually have to impact your life um, for you to consider making a change? Um, as well as, once again, you can discuss the patient's pros and cons of use. Um, and you know, what do you like about drinking? What do you think? What do you not like about it? Um, what might be some reasons to make a change? Reasons not to make a change? Um, so just using open-ended questions to really explore the person's use. Okay, so that's uh, step three. Moving on to step four. And as you, one of the things you might have caught there is that um, there's a knock at the door. So that is signaling that they have five minutes left. Um, for step four, what the, we're looking for is this transitional point where 
the conver really providing a summary of the conversation up to that point and the person's readiness, um, and then actually you know asking some kind of a question about what do you think you'll do. Um, if the patient indicates that they're actually ready to make a change of some sort, talking about what would that change look like and, and what steps might the person take to actually make that change. Um, and then offering a menu of choices. Um, if the person says, yeah, I think I, I, think I want to cut back to low-risk drinking guidelines, um, then finding out you know, what steps might they want to take to do that, what would help them do that. Um, if the provider um, hasn't really made a clear recommendation about you know, what they think would be in the person's best um, either physical or mental health, um, this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, and the other piece of this step is to secure agree agreement for a follow-up. So actually asking the person to, you know, would it be okay if we call you in four weeks or would you might, when you come back in to, for a checkup, um, could I talk to you? So let's listen to uh, Jan uh, deliver step four. Well, um Sounds like you're ready to think about that. And I'd like to brainstorm with you some specific plans to do that, Michael. Um, any ideas you have when you're, um, you're the client and the people you're contracting for say, come on, I'll get a round, or I'll get a second round. Any ideas there for words you might use? Or? Uh, I mean, I, I suppose I could do like a club soda or something. Right. Okay, okay. So that would reduce those those drinking numbers on any given day, if we could get those down to one or two. Okay, have a coach the next time say... i have one drink a night instead of uh, with dinner and stuff, too. Boy, those would get your numbers down to those recommended levels, Michael. And I would encourage that. Now, your doctor's going to want to see you, I think, again, because of the medication you're on. Um, so let's, let's make an appointment to see me again. The next time you see him, I think that'll probably be in about four weeks, um, and I'm I'm hoping that we can have some success maybe with uh, cutting back. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm also going to give you a, a piece of paper that lists some of those limits, and I give this to all the patients that I see. Um, it, it gives the drinking limits, the weekly drinking limits, the size limits. Um, it just has some information that you can use as a reminder. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. So transitioning from enhancing motivation to negotiating a plan, as I mentioned, this is a good place to uh, provide a summary. Um, and she didn't, I think one of the things that happened here is that, as you noticed, I said there was a knock at the door, and I often notice this with these interviews is, you know, if time is running short quite often, um, the last step might not get quite as much attention. Um, a good transition for this might be decide, you know, really it's recapping the conversation. You know, well, you know, this is news to you, but you're realizing that the alcohol may be aggravating your stomach and you don't want to be in the risky zone. Um, and, you know, you're surprised that you are drinking over the limits. And actually asking a question, you know, given this, what are you willing to change? Then negotiating a plan then, what steps would you be willing to take? Um, now this is where she moves into a little bit more of a directing role to ask, you know, advice to cut back and offers to explore some options. So it's okay to do the advising. You just have to decide, you know, where exactly to put that. Um, she asked about his ideas to manage the times he drinks. Um, he says he could change to a club soda or something. Uh, one drink a night, um, maybe two a day. And this is um, like it didn't really get explored too much on weekends where he was drinking five or six. So one of the coaching things would be it, when you get to the feedback and somebody says, yeah, I might consider cutting back, I could drink a club soda, what is the actual drinking goal? Because I think it's really powerful for people to say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to drink any more than two a day. That's a very concrete goal. Um, in this case, the goal is somewhat unclear, so that might be a coaching suggestion. Um, 
The other piece is, is to offer a menu of choices. And the menu of choices, what we're talking about can either be, when you get to this step, you know, people might, there might be several different ideas about what kind of changes they might be open or willing to make. And so, you know, to say, well, you know, once you provide the summary, to actually say, well, you know, sometimes people decide to take a break and not drink for a couple of weeks, or they decide they want to cut back to the NIAAA um, guidelines. Sometimes they decide that they set, you know, a daily limit or a weekly limit. Um, but actually talking about, so there's really two, when, you're ta when we're talking about menu of choices, there's two different ones. There's like, okay, what you might decide to do as your change goal, but then how do you actually go about it? So if somebody says, you know, if somebody is drinking 25, 28 drinks and says, well, okay, I'm just going to cut back, how might they do that? Um, and what might be some strategies for that? Um, now, in this case, she started with a section offering a recommendation. Um, she, the other piece of this is she, she did solidify a follow-up in four weeks. Um, and, you know, she didn't necessarily go through the menu of choices, more because he identified that he could start drinking club soda, and given the time um, limitations may have been one reason. If there had been more time, there could have been a little bit more um, exploration here. But overall, um, that one, so as you'll see in the Fidelity instrument, there are, some of them have two or three different items within that. So part of this has somewhat of a subjective rating of, okay, depending to what degree that was done, will I do yes or no? And Sarah, at one point in time, we had used more of a scale um, to identify this, and there, there was a reason that we switched to just using yes or no, and, and Sarah and I are going to talk more about that here in just a minute. Um, here is, I just included in here, the menu of choices for change. Um, you can see these are sometimes what you might review uh, with the client. And then the final uh, part of this is to identify, this is the one scale that looks at the motivational style they use, so on that seven-point scale, to what degree did the provider use a motivational style? Um, and, you know, in Jan's, who I think I actually was the one who rated Jan's, you know, I would say probably, you know, a five or a six. I mean, she was very, uh, very nonjudgmental. Um, she asked several open-ended questions. She, she, there would be the one coaching suggestion would be there were a few opportunities uh, to use some additional reflections. And then, as you can see, if you have the actual rating form pulled up, there is then a final place uh, to talk about um, any final comments about the uh, provider's demonstration. And what, I, what I've typically found is that don't want to overwhelm people with a ton of feedback, but quite often, I mean, and sometimes they, people do a really great job and there's not a lot to add there. Um, oftentimes, though, I will identify maybe a couple of key coaching suggestions that I think would be really helpful for that person um, before they deliver their next brief intervention. So that, that walks you through the fidelity process. Any, any questions? So I do have one here that I can read to you from the question okay. box. Uh, from Jerry, we had, how would you provide feedback if you use the craft for adolescents where, they, where there aren't really safe guide, guidelines? Yeah, um, well, it's kind of, I, I have not actually, um, I haven't done a lot of work with the craft, but I guess I can relate my experience with using the five Ps for pregnant women. Um, and so, at that point in time, like, it's the same thing. The recommendation then becomes, um, you know, that there, are no, that, that there are no safe limits. The feedback session actually becomes, like, what are some of the risks related to drinking um, under the age of 21 or drug use? And really, you know, so the feedback, but it does have to be adapted. And, you know, I know I would be great, and there may be some out there, but, you know, those, I think those visual guidelines are so helpful. There are definitely a lot of education sheets out there, uh, but it just has to shift depending on the population that you're working on or working with. And, um, you know, and then at the same time, I think during the final negotiating change plan, 
and that's a piece of this is being clear about your recommendation for the person but also being willing to find out what, if anything, they're willing to do to decrease uh, the harm of their use. Any other questions, Danielle? So hopefully that answered your question, Sherry. Not at this time. Okay, let's, uh, moving on. Um, so the models for the fidelity rating, there, were two there are two different models that are being used in this project. The first model, um, the student gets a chance to uh, work with the standardized patient two times. Uh, they're all audio taped. Um, so they complete their first uh, standardized patient interview. Um, then it is coded uh, by a few of us who are doing the coding for UMKC. They receive back written fidelity rating um, a couple of weeks after they deliver the brief intervention. And then they get an opportunity to do a second brief intervention, which is also uh, recorded and coded, and they receive uh, a second uh, set of feedback. The other model actually does a, a live coaching for the first session. So they do the same standardized patient, uh, but there are one of the faculties are available and are doing coaching through the uh, actual intervention. And then immediately following that, they are given an opportunity to do a second brief intervention. Um, so it is a little bit, this model, they, you know, get the feedback and they immediately get to go and practice uh, a second time. This, as you can see here, is uh, the fidelity ratings um, up to this point, a little over 600. And it gives you an idea, and basically, as I mentioned, it's a yes or no. And so um, basically this tells you, you know, did the person explain their role and respectfully ask permission? You can, as you can see here, you know, 96% do that piece. Um, sharing the auditor DAS score is pretty high. Um, it goes down a little bit when we're talking about the guidelines. Uh, the readiness ruler is something clearly that uh, students feel pretty comfortable with. Um, and the follow-up question, um, you'll notice here that uh, providing a summary of readiness was one of the areas that was a little lower. Um, Sarah's going to talk more about that. Um, and negotiating a change plan. And then the final one here gives you on that seven-point scale of overall motivational style, um, people were hitting about 3.98 or pretty close to a 4. And I just have to say, if I'm quite often, if I'm giving somebody a 4, they're using a few of the motivational interviewing strategies, um, but, you know, not really strong on that, but, you know, they're beginning to incorporate a few. Um, so I'm going to um, ask Sarah to join us at this point in time and just talk about, um, have, ask her to talk about some of the lessons learned in using this particular uh, model for fidelity rating. Um, Sarah, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, yeah. everybody. <laughs> hey, Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much. Sarah is the project coordinator uh, for the UMKC Esper project. Um, what I wanted to start off with, um, Sarah is asking you, you know, in looking at this, what, what's probably, would you say, the most interesting observation um, you've made from looking at the results of the fidelity rating forms and, and the ability of the students to deliver the BNI? Sure. Well, First of all, I think it's really interesting to be able to step back and look at the aggregate ratings across all students. And so kind of looking at that, the key takeaway that I get is that the students are really demonstrating a high level of completion of the brief negotiated interview steps, which is great. But we're seeing more moderate levels of motivational style. I think the average rating was around four on a scale of one to seven. So kind of what that says to me is you can go through and complete you know, the BNI to fidelity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you used a lot of motivational interviewing skills throughout. And I think a lot of that could be attributed to just the lack of time we have to focus specifically on motivational interviewing. We go over, you know, the guiding communication style and some key skills like open-ended questions, reflections, and summaries, but we don't have a ton of time to dedicate to motivational interviewing. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how, you know, the most interesting point to me that stands out when I look at the overall fidelity. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. So, yeah, the idea that, you know, given the time that you have, teaching those steps is doable, but teaching the broader kind of context of doing a motivational interviewing type style, it sounds like probably is more related to the time to actually teach that piece. 
And, you know, one of the things I would say is uh, one of the first, or, or a project that I spent a lot of time on in um, Washington, Espert, we, we probably paid a little more attention in our training to motivational interviewing, and we had follow-up learning collaboratives for the behavioral health specialist. And um, one of the things that we saw, because we didn't focus as much on, the, and I think this is part of the uh, fidelity conundrum, are you going to focus on the motivational interviewing piece of delivering a brief intervention or more on these more concrete steps? And in that case, we did more focus on the motivational interviewing, but then we found, and we didn't do nearly as much fidelity uh, assessing, but we found that uh, they actually didn't go through and do, you know, provide the feedback uh, very comprehensively. So um, just, I think, um, both a result of, you know, what, what does the training focus on, and then also the fidelity um, kind of focus as well. And build, building on that point, um, kind of we after a year through the project we took a step back and looked at our fidelity ratings and we made some changes based on that and tried to emphasize to students like you're saying the importance of remembering the overall motivational interviewing spirit throughout the BNI and trying as hard as you can to not get bogged down in perfectly executing each step but you know trying to keep in mind the overall style is really the foundation of the BNI yeah, that, that that that's a good that's a great point, and that that it it is because they're they look at okay here's ten items and I have to get ten items which um, you know that's a, kind of this fidelity instrument like yeah but that's not you don't have to you know do every single one of those it's like you know the the interview being more important but that's that's a tricky piece when you're actually rating somebody and um, you know they're they're wanting to make sure they do all of it. Um, the second question I had was to, can you tell us a little bit more, you have the two models that I talked about that you're using of the live coaching versus those that get just the uh, written feedback, and what differences have you uh, noticed between the two? Sure. So um, we started out primarily with model one where everything was audio taped. Um, but we found that switching to Model 2 and having coaching for that first session is just extremely beneficial to students. Um, I worked on kind of different aspects of the project and primarily I'm giving instructions to students before they do their standardized patient interaction, but I've also done live coaching and I've also audio taped. And kind of a key observation is that I see an increase in confidence after the student completes their first session with a live coach in the room. They typically go in kind of nervous, you know, it's typically a faculty member in their department, so they're kind of, you know, self-conscious having a faculty person in the room observing them, but when they come out, I always, we debrief and I ask, you know, how did they think it went? And they, they normally tell me that it went a lot better than they expected, and, and I can just tell that they have more confidence in their ability to deliver the BNI when they're getting feedback right away from a faculty person. Um, and also, I think it's a great opportunity for faculty to become more engaged in the expert training and really reinforce the students that they um, see the importance of expert in their, in their respective profession. So I think those are kind of two key takeaways of live coaching. And so we've really moved to model two for all student groups when it's possible. Great, great. So they get that really immediate feedback and then actually get to um, practice that after you give them some feedback. Is that pretty much how you guys are doing the live coaching? Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, so the live coach sits in the room and observes. They typically um, don't give feedback until the brief intervention is over unless the student just kind of starts off on the wrong track and they think it would be beneficial to start over. But then they get okay. feedback at the end. And then the student comes out, I give them a second um, patient scenario, and they, they get to go back in with a new scenario and apply what they just learned. And so I think it's really beneficial to get that feedback more immediately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And practice it right afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Great, mm -hmm. great. And I do like that piece of also, I think the faculty um, as they, and I would say just to add on to what you said, is I know for myself um, when I moved into doing a lot of coaching and coding, I think we, for me, I also learned, you know, a lot just from that about how to deliver an effective B and I um, by just coaching other people and listening and thinking about like what what would be my coaching advice be. So I'm sure it's probably 
um, though you might not be able to measure it, improving the faculty skills as well. Would you say that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, when I coach myself, I, I hear students say cer certain things that I'm really impressed by, and I think, wow, I need to remember that. <laughs> right. So it's, it's cool, and also faculty, it's a, it's a great opportunity for them to work one-on-one -on -one with students and really see um, their skills come to life. And so faculty often in coaching really energized by being able to see their students deliver the BNI so well. So I think it's a positive experience for everyone. Great, great, thanks. And then the next thing I'm wondering, how, how would you say the fidelity rating? Because I know, you know, I, like I said, I have been involved in quite a few projects and some of, it, some of them had fidelity ratings, some of them didn't. So I'm wondering as, you know, making which your project made fidelity be, you know, around the BI a very um, prominent part of the project, how would you say that rating has been valuable um, to the project as a whole, not just to the students? Sure. Well, from a program evaluation standpoint, I think it's really helpful to see what parts of our curriculum are doing well and what could use some improvement. So, you know, our lowest um, rate of completion was for providing a summary of readiness during um, step four of negotiating a plan. And so, you know, after year one, we noticed that that was a lot lower, and so we really tried to go back and enhance the curriculum and emphasize the importance of providing that summary. And I think, again, that goes back to just having such a limited time to teach motivational interviewing where mm -hmm. students get the skills of, you know, providing summaries. And so we've really tried to emphasize the importance of that. So I think it's just a great means for evaluation. You can see what's being you know, translated well, what could maybe be emphasized more. So I think it's very beneficial to the project. Great, right. Yeah, and, I, you know, I would just second that in, <clears throat> you know, doing a lot of the training around this. It's really informed me sometimes about, like, oh, I, I get, I, I, another example would be, I know in my training I often start, I've started to emphasize more, like, how do you explain what the risky zone means or how do you explain what the harmful zone means? Um, it may not always be captured on the fidelity instrument unless it's in kind of the coaching thing, but I notice that that's something that um, students kind of can struggle with at times. Um, so I think it's really helpful for, you know, as we continue to train and um, educate people around the brief intervention. Um, and finally, I wanted to ask you about, do you, do you have a sense of what type of feedback is the most helpful to the students' learning? process, and I know you were going to talk a little bit about the changes that you guys made to the rating instrument itself. Yeah, so um, our first semester we learned quite a bit, the hard way, what type of feedback students preferred. Um, we started with a more complex fidelity rating tool that instead of providing yes or no for each, uh, for completion of each step, we had a scale of one to four for how well the student completed each step. And so um, the first semester, I returned the feedback to a large group of students and got quite a bit of pushback. Um, the students really felt that they were being graded instead of, you know, viewing the feedback in a constructive way of, you know, ways they could improve. They, it just felt really critical having it on the scale. It was just too much information, maybe too complex. Mm -hmm. and so. Um, obviously we want, you know, the feedback to be helpful to students. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board and revised our fidelity rating to change back to just a yes or no. And, um, you know, based on that, I've, I've gotten a lot better feedback from students that, you know, they're able to take in the information a little bit better. And what we try to do is really utilize the comments section next to each step. So let's say they did the step, but maybe you have an idea for a reflection they could have used or a way they could have said it a little better, we can use the comment section to give them that information, but it's not perceived quite as critical that way um, if we're just doing yes or no. So that, that was a big lesson to learn for sure. Yeah, so they really to, because I think, you know, on the average, you know, most of them do, um, you know, do almost, you know, at least 80 to 90 percent of all the tasks, and so that they really do, that they, that they know the process itself. It's just then um, really refining um, how they actually deliver the brief intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I do think this is a piece where, you know, if we're providing feedback, 
you, you do want them to walk away feeling positive about it. And at the same time, um, so I would say one of the things I think I have learned over the course of this process as well is like sometimes um, less is better. So, you know, find two things that you think would really maybe help that person, um, but don't overwhelm them with information at the same time. Oh. Well, any any other final comments, um, Sarah, about lessons learned? The only other lesson I would say is just, um, it kind of goes back to what you were just saying. Um, knowing that students prefer simplified feedback, we try to keep that in mind for the live coaching as well. Um, coaches use the same fidelity rating for uh, while they're observing students, but you know, you don't need to necessarily go down the line and give them feedback on each minute step. We try to keep it a little bit more general, give them, start with some strengths that they did well, and then a few key coaching suggestions for next time. So, you know, just trying not to overwhelm with too much feedback, like you said, both written and in person for live coaching. Yeah, and that's a great point to give them as much positive feedback as, you know, also point out opportunities for a change as well, I think is really key, um, you know, to help increase their confidence. Hey, well, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to open it back up to uh, questions from the group, and then we will uh, uh, wrap up. So if you have any questions for either uh, Sarah or myself, and want to type them in or raise your hand. Um, we um, have plenty of time for some questions. We don't have any in the question box at the moment, but I'm here to read those. Well, what was that, Danielle? Did you, I missed what you said at the end there. Um, I'm here to read any that come up, and someone did just submit one, so from okay, Jerry. Right. Uh, do you have any research or follow-up linking the ratio of the BI to any outcomes regarding reduction in drinking or drug use or abstinence? Do, relative to this project, uh, Sarah, do you guys have anything? You guys aren't measuring outcomes because these, of course, are standardized patients. Yeah. But Right. Yeah, we don't have that. The only um, outcomes we're working on measuring now is having students implement the BI at their clinical placements with actual patients. Um, so this semester we started collecting um, data, having clinical preceptors do fidelity ratings um, of students completing a BI with an actual patient, but we're not collecting anything regarding health outcomes. Yeah, and I on a general thing, I don't, you know, of course there, are, like I'm aware of um, the statistics around, you know, doing a complete SBIRT and reduction in drug use, which, you know, typically range from about 30 to 40 percent reduction in um, alcohol use anyway with a brief intervention, um, as well as, you know, emergency room admissions and, um, uh, accidents. Uh, so there's definitely specific, what, what I haven't seen, and it doesn't mean that it's not out there, is very specific to, because one thing I didn't mention is there are several different um, models for delivering a brief intervention. Um, one of the reasons that I know in the projects I've worked with we decided to go with a brief negotiated interview is that it really does have more of that uses more of the motivational interviewing, which we do know tends to work better for individuals who may be more in pre-contemplation or contemplation. Um, but specific to using the, the, the BNI and outcomes, I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen a specific study on that, just more generally using um, SBIRT. Any other questions? Not at this time. OK, great. Um, well, I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, my contact information is on um, the slide there, as well as Sarah's. If you, if you have more specific questions about the project itself, um, 
And uh, you know, just in wrapping up, I I do really want to like commend this project because it, you know it really is looking and looking at fidelity. I guess less in the research aspect, but more really in um, using it as a tool to help people um, learn and improve their skills around delivering a brief intervention. And uh, uh, any final words from you, Sarah? I think she might be. No, I just want to thank you so much for having me and highlighting. Oops. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much for having me, highlighting our project. And um, Dina has really helped us with our fidelity rating and developing this in the first place. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a great project to work on. And hopefully, thank you all for joining us and uh, learning a bit about this. I, I hope we continue to learn uh, with as many ESPER projects how to Really, the key being, you know, how because you know the screening part and the referral to treatment um, really do depend on that initial link of the brief intervention. Um, so, you know, we want to identify individuals who might benefit from a change, and you know, and then for those individuals who actually need more services to get them linked up to referral to treatment. Um, but really, being able to effectively deliver a, a brief intervention is really a key component of experts, so it's it's um, interesting to learn as we go along and um, uh, find out really what helps people deliver that effectively. So uh, thanks all for joining us, and uh, thanks uh, Danielle for hosting. Um, and, and unless there's any further questions, we're a little bit early, but uh, we'll wrap up at this point in time. It looks like nothing further has come through other than a thank you from Sarah. Uh, thank you to Dina and Sarah. Um, we will host this recording on our website, so irata.org. Uh, if anyone has any interest in viewing later, you'll also get a link to the recording so that you could forward that on if you think someone would have an interest. Um, and along with the contact information above. If you have any general questions, you can email us at info at irreta.org. So I-N-F-O at I-R-E-T-A dot O-R-G. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.